Welcome to the Wilds Cast. Just finished up an amazing conversation with quite an interesting personality, Dan Grunfeld, who is the grandson of Holocaust survivors. His dad played for the New York Knicks, was in the NBA for years, and was the only basketball player in the NBA whose parents were Holocaust survivors. And he was a very good person to have a conversation about anti-Semitism coming from the left. Because I just posted, literally last night, listened to this terrible, hate-filled speech from the commencement speaker at CUNY Law School's graduation. And listen to what this woman said. She said that Israel is raining bullets and bombs on worshipers, indiscriminately murdering the old, the young, attacking funerals and graveyards, completely just lies. And the whole place is clapping. Other students, faculty administration. So I asked my guest, I asked Dan, who is a grandson of Holocaust survivors who went to Stanford, how he feels about this and what he thinks we can do. He's also got a a unique connection with the NBA because of his father, who, by the way, also won a gold medal for the United States in the Olympics. And it's unbelievable how much he talks about his grandmother and the advice his grandmother gives him in terms of dealing with anti-Semitism. This is a very, very important conversation. I hope you'll tune in to hear someone with a unique perspective who is the child of the child of Holocaust survivors in the world of athletics. Where was the NBA and where were some of the other great athletes? When Kyrie Irving came out with these terrible anti-Semitic statements, what's happening between Jews and blacks and between just the world and the Jewish people? Okay, welcome to the Wildcast. I have with me Dan Grunfeld. Thank you so much. Grunfeld, uh, did I mess that up already? <laughs> it's Grunfeld, but uh, it all answered either. <laughs> okay, good. Welcome, Dan. Thank you so much for coming on the Wildcast. This is MGE's podcast. You have um, quite the resume and quite the background. So let's let's start at the beginning, if that's okay. Um, tell us a little about um, your grandparents. I know you've got some Holocaust survivor history there. Um, paint us a little picture for our audience, uh, the story. And by the way, if you ever, if I ever look down, it's because I'm taking some notes from things that you're writing. I am listening. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, both of my grandparents are Holocaust survivors. And so they, they survived in Hungary. My grandmother turns 98 in a few weeks. Oh, wow. So she's doing amazingly well. You know, she's the, you know, our family has had success on the basketball court and a little bit off the court, but my grandmother is the star of our family. She's the star of our story. And yeah, she, so my grandfather survived the Holocaust in a forced labor camp in Hungary. So he didn't have it easy, but he had it easier than my grandmother. My grandmother mm-hmm. was on the run in Budapest. And uh, this is your, safe. I'm sorry, this is your mother's mother or your father's mother? My dad's mom. Your dad's dad. mom. So, okay. You know, my dad would go on to be an NBA basketball player and he's the only player in NBA history whose parents are Holocaust survivors. He's wow. actually the only player in any of the major American sports leagues whose parents survived the Holocaust. And so, yeah, my grandfather, again, forced labor camp in Hungary. My grandmother saved twice by Raul Wallenberg in Budapest. She was in the Budapest ghetto. Wow. She had a, you know, Wallenberg issued protective passports called Schutz passes for Jews in, in Budapest. And mm-hmm. my grandmother got one for herself. She risked her life to obtain 17 passes for other people. You know, when I talk about this story, I, I say, you know, my grandmother's not only my hero, she's also a hero. And it's the truth. And again, she turns 98 in a few weeks. And so she's the greatest. God bless her. That's amazing. Where, where is she live close to you? Do you see her often? She lives in the Bay Area mm-hmm. where I lived with my family up until about a year and a half ago. So uh-huh. we we don't see her in person as much as we used to, but we FaceTime with her every day. You know, I have two young kids at home. And so she wow. sees her great grandkids every day. And wow. you know, so my grandparents both survived, as I mentioned. My grandmother lost five siblings and both parents. And my grandfather lost both his sisters and both his parents. So, oh you know, my dad, you know, never had grandparents. They were all killed in Auschwitz. So this must be a major, uh, a major theme in your family, obviously, growing up for your dad, for obviously for your grandparents. Um, your father um, has, as you just mentioned, a lengthy and very successful career with the NBA, both as a player and as an executive. Tell us a little about um, any obstacles uh, that he, a Jew, son of refugees who came to the United States, survivors of the war, of the Holocaust, 
Um, what, what was it like for him as a, as, as a player for the NBA and the only Holocaust, you know, uh, uh, the only survivor's children that made it in the NBA? That must have been quite unique. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, very unique. And so as an NBA athlete, you know, m- my dad was treated well. You know, he's the only Jewish player to wear number 18 for the New York Knicks. Oh. Right? So, you know, he, he had a, a long and successful career. But, you know, you mentioned my dad being the son of refugees. He himself yeah. is a refugee, right? They fled communist Romania under duress when my dad was eight years old. And they came to the United States when my dad was nine years old. He spoke three languages fluently at that point, Hungarian, Romanian, and Italian. He didn't speak a word of English, and he had never touched a basketball. And my dad had an older brother who was eight years older than him. And what my dad called his older brother in their native language, Hungarian, translates to English as my king. So that's how much my dad revered his older brother. So my (laughs) uncle was diagnosed with leukemia a few months after arriving in the United States, and he passed away within a year. So after all this tragedy, you know, the Holocaust, fleeing communism, coming to America, having a chance at a better life in New York City, my uncle passes away. And so, you know, my book is called By the Grace of the Game, because my dad just went to the local playground in Queens, New York to make friends, learn English, heal from that loss. He started playing basketball and kind of in the blink of an eye, he was one of the best players in the country. You know, he's one of wow. the most highly recruited players. He went to the University of Tennessee, where he's a four-time all-conference selection, SEC player of the year. So, you know, again, basketball shined its light on our family when we really needed it. But, you know, once my dad made it to the NBA and he had this big career, he was already assimilated. But it's really what the game did for our family when when we came to America. That's so powerful. And was he the only Jew? And uh, he was clearly not the only Jew in the league. But were there other Jews that that he, was it more common for there to be NBA players that are Jewish in, in, in the NBA? There weren't many. There, there were some Jewish basketball players in the NBA at that time who were, you know, kind of in and out of the league, but it, it wasn't very common at all. And, you know, and I write in my book about the Jewish roots of basketball in the NBA. And the first NBA game was played in 1946 between the New York Knicks and the Toronto Huskies. All five members of the Knicks starting five were Jewish. Right. Then I remember. Yep. Then I remember hearing. Wow. So what yeah, year the- was, was your dad playing? My dad played in the NBA from 1977 to 1986. Right. So, so that's not so long ago. So there weren't no, really too many Jews then. There, wow. there weren't too many Jewish players at all. And, you know, my, my dad was a successful player. Again, he was, a, he was a phenom as a high school basketball player. He was a phenom as a college basketball player. He was more of a role player in the NBA, but had a successful, again, nine-year NBA career. Wow. So he, was, you know, he, was, he just had an excellent run, but he was definitely the most prominent Jewish basketball player of his era. And he always, please forgive my ignorance, he always played for the Knicks or other teams? He played for the Milwaukee Bucks, the Kansas mm-hmm. City Kings, and then the mm-hmm. last four years of his career for the New York Knicks. And you're like, you know, my, my family story is a very New York story, right? Because mm-hmm. that's where my family came out from Europe. And so my dad grew up, you know, after his brother passed, learning the language. You know, he would take the subway from Queens, New York. My dad, my grandfather would take the subway from the Bronx where their fabric store was. They would buy the cheapest tickets at Madison Square Garden because that's what they could afford. They'd sit in the last row and they'd watch the Knicks. You know, and that's where my dad kind of learned the game, learned the oh language. Wow. So all these years later, he's a player for the Knicks and that's where he finished his career. And then he'd end up to become the general manager of the team. So when the Knicks went to the finals in 1994 and 1999, you know, my dad built those teams, which is, you know, wow. it's really a Cinderella story, right? This is a boy. Wow. I didn't, I didn't realize he, he was general manager when they, that's incredible. Yeah, that's incredible. And and he um, did he experience any anti-Semitism as uh, I mean, it's 1977 to 1986. I'm trying to think where I was in my life. <laughs> I was in elementary school. But <laughs> um, did, did, did he have it? Was it difficult for him as a Jew or not really? No, it wasn't. You know, you, you like to think of sports as a great equalizer, great yeah. connector. And that, that's what it was for him. Right. He that's did. wonderful. Yeah, he, he didn't experience it. You know, listen, he played college basketball in Knoxville, you know, in Knoxville, Tennessee, down south. And, you know, he teamed with another great New Yorker, Bernard King. And they mm-hmm. were one of the greatest duos in college basketball history. They were called the Ernie wow. and Bernie Show. Ernie you know, and, and Bernie. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, and how, did he get, how did he get the 18? Did he request the 18, the number 18, when he was on the Knicks? Yes. Yep. That was – yes. He, he wore awesome. number 18. And, you know, my dad is, is quiet. He's never – 
you know, he doesn't, he's not that out there with our family's history. Listen, there's a lot of pain, right, associated with, you know, losing all his grandparents and fleeing. And, and so he doesn't talk about it that much, but that was a powerful signal, right? He wanted to wear number 18 when he played for the Knicks. And so, sure. yeah, and, and, you know, it just shows kind of how much Judaism and how, mm-hmm. how much it means to him, how important it is to him. Did, did he get into, I mean, you said he was quiet about it, but um, did it come up at all as, as, a, as a professional basketball player? Um, and, you know, the only thing I've ever heard have you heard this story about uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's father? Do you know this? No. So there is, this is pretty well documented in Rabbi Lau's book. Rabbi Lau was the former chief rabbi of Israel, who was the younger survivor of, book, of, of uh, Buchenwald. Hmm. And what part of the liberating American forces um, I'm, you know, I don't want to get this wrong. It's either Bergen Belsen or, Bo- or Buchenwald. I'm not sure. It might have been Bergen Belsen. He was about six or eight years old, and Karim Abdul Jabbar's father was an American soldier with the liberating, uh, you know, with, with, with the United States oh. that was li- liberating the camps. And there's a story that's in the book that Karim Abdul sees Rabbi Lau. He's like six or eight years old, picks him up like in one hand. <laughs> and and says to a group of passerbyers who, you know, they were in the camps for a couple of weeks after they were liberated still. And he was like upset that people were staring at the survivors that were still, you know, alive. And he picked up Kareem Abdul, uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar's father picked up Rabbi Lau, a little boy. And he says, This is what you were afraid of? This is what the Nazis were oh, fearful wow. of, like this little kid. This little boy, wow. You know, but when I saw when I started reading your father's biography and the story and your book, and I, I, um, I know it just kind of reminded me of that a little. Just the Incredible. only other connection to basketball I could think of in the Shoah, you know. Yeah, no, that, that that's an incredible story. Yeah, listen, my, my dad is the only athlete, as I mentioned, whose parents are survivors. So there's just there's not that many links right between the holocaust and the nba yeah so it's it's just an atypical story yeah now you you had a uh you went to stanford and um and you which was followed up by a prestigious career also playing basketball overseas including israel what tell us a little about that tell us a little about your own basketball experiences yeah absolutely and I, i in my book i i really juxtapose my upbringing with my family's right? because you know my dad again born under communism son of holocaust survivors my birth was literally planned around the nba basketball calendar you know my dad was <laughs> playing for the knicks he had two long road trips i was delivered by c-section and so my family planned my arrival so he could go on one road trip be there for my birth go on another road trip be there for my bris right so that's well, how i came well that's uh, that was very compliant of you i mean it was nice for you to be so Listen, you know, I, C- C-section delivery. So, I, you know, they <laughs> they, they kind of had me come when they wanted me to come. Right, exactly. Uh, but, and I write in my book, you know, like the Carnegie Deli catered my bris, right? And, you know, my dad was a Jewish basketball player wearing number 18 for the New York Knicks. Parents are Holocaust survivors. I write in my book, you know, the Carnegie Deli is going to cater his son's bris. You know, and that's, that's the way it worked. And that's how I came into the world. Right. My dad, of course, had no such luxuries. My, my grandparents, obviously not. And, I always wanted to be a, an NBA basketball player like my dad, right? And that was, and I, and I write in my book about my dad. He didn't even know what was possible with basketball. It was just kind of, it was salvation for him. It was an escape. And so he put one foot in front of the other. And before he knew it, he was standing at the top of that mountain. I, from the time I was a little kid, had my eyes right. fixed on that peak, right? And right. that's, it's a steep climb. And so it motivated me. It drove me. It held me back at times. And I'm pretty honest about that. But yeah, listen, I, I always, I wanted to play basketball at Stanford from the time I was in sixth grade because my grandmother lives 25 minutes from campus. <laughs> and so, and I write in the book, right, that was a, that was a long shot for a slow Jewish kid from the suburbs, which is what I was, <laughs> but through a combination. Can, of, you're sitting down, Dan, but can, how, how tall are you? Six foot six. Oh. That helps, okay. right? I mean, we're, we're, and how we're tall big is your guys. Dad? How tall is your dad? He's also six, six. Wow. Okay. But my dad, so. My dad in high school was 6'5", 225 pounds. 
you know, when my dad visited Notre Dame, when he was a high school basketball player, their football coach, Eric Parsegian, took one look at him on his recruiting visit and said, if you come to Notre Dame, you're playing football for the Irish too, right? That's right. how my dad was built. Right. Uh, he's st- I, I wasn't quite that stocky, but listen, we, we have the, the size on our side. Uh, but yeah, I, I always wanted to play basketball like my dad did. And I got to Stanford through a combination of luck, timing, a little bit of skill, had a successful career there, suffered a bad knee injury at the worst mm-hmm. time. You know, I was a few weeks from leaving school to go to the NBA. I was the second leading scorer in the conference. Tore oh. my ACL on national television. Oh. My grandmother sitting 20 feet away. You know, she came to every single home game I played. And, you know, that was kind of my path, my trajectory. I had a nice career in Europe and all over the world. Played eight years. The last four years of my career were in Israel. Wow. Where'd you play? Yeah. Well, before we get to Israel, it must have been so nice to have your grandmother watching the games. Oh, it was the greatest. Oh. She didn't miss one game, oh. one home game. She was there every single, every single time. And, when I got hurt, it was our second half basket. And that's where my grandmother sat. She sat behind our second half basket. And I knew right away something was really bad. I was on the floor, you know, rolling around and everyone ran out to to deal with me, all the trainers. And when I finally came to my senses, I realized my grandmother was kneeling down next to me, rubbing my head. Oh, she was right? on the and, court. You know, the, the ushers wouldn't have stopped her. I never even asked, have asked her, how did you get down? She just came, <laughs> you know, but... That, you know, and, and wow. we had dinner that night after this really crushing injury when I was so close to achieving this dream. And there's my grandma, you know, who lost five siblings, both parents in the Holocaust, survived, oh, saved wow. people, gives you gives you a real sense of perspective. And also, yeah, and it must have just been so special for her to be in a free country watching her grandson on playing for like a college bat, like after her son. That's unbelievable. Yeah, it's great. My book is called By the Grace of the Game, as I mentioned, for these reasons. You know, and yeah. My dad, when he was at Tennessee and he was having all this success, he had an opportunity to try out for the United States Olympic team his junior Ooh. year, and he made the team. Whoa. So my grandparents got to – they closed their fabric store for two weeks, and they drove from Queens, New York, to Montreal, Canada, and they watched my dad stand on top of the Olympic podium and become a gold medalist for the United States. A oh. dozen years after arriving in this country as that little boy who didn't speak Your English. father became a gold medalist? For the United States of America, right? So all things are possible, and that's that's our story. And I, and listen, this is my family's version of a familiar story for the Jewish yeah. people. Yeah. We just happen to have this basketball top angle, right? But you know, you overcome adversity, you deal with what life throws at you, you yeah. stay together, you stay positive, and you know the game did a lot for us. But it's it, it's just it's a Jewish story. That's a beautiful story. All things possible. That's amazing. Really, yeah. really amazing. Uh, so let's go back. Um, let's go back to Israel. So you said you played for four years in Israel. Where, like with who, what, what was the deal with that? So my first foray to Israel was in the Maccabee games. So wow. in 2000, and my dad played in 1973. Actually, his team, he was a senior in high school. He was the leading scorer. His team won the silver medal. They lost to Tal Brody and Mickey Berkovich, very famous Israeli basketball players in the gold medal game. I played in 2009. We won the gold medal. And so I could always say to my dad, well, you have an Olympic gold medal, but I have a Maccabee games gold medal, <laughs> right? So... We, we, we laugh about that. But that was my first time in Israel. And my sister, my older sister, I'm very close with. It was her first time as well. She, My whole family came to watch us play. And I remember after a few days saying, I'm finishing my career here. You know, it was just so powerful, right? Being in Israel as a Jewish basketball player, your grandparents, Holocaust survivors. And actually, my my family was supposed to go to Israel. It was Israel that paid money for each Jewish family the communists would allow to leave Romania. And so when my family left, fled Romania, they had passports for Israel. Mm. They spent six months in Rome, worked with Hyas, Hebrew immigrant yeah. aides. Yeah, I know Hyas. Hyas so. That helped my family get to the United States. But the rest, you know, many, most of my family ended up in Israel. So such a dear place to us. And it was so powerful. And I said, yeah, I'm going to finish my career here. And that's what I did. So I played two years in Herzliya and I played two years in Jerusalem. Wow. wow. By the way, another little connection. My dad's first job out of law school was working for Hayas, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. My Amazing. dad, who just turned 90, is, was uh, an immigration lawyer for his whole career. But he, um, that was a big, big part of his ca- career trajectory was was working with Hayas. So it's amazing to, <laughs> we're the grandchildren of yeah. the sons, the sons or grants. Pretty unbelievable. 
Well, God bless um, them almost 90. And, you know, they do such yeah. amazing work even today for refugees all yeah. over the world. Yeah, so it, it's, it's a powerful, important organization. And and I, I assume you're not playing. I mean, maybe you're shooting the ball around with your kids, but you're not playing professionally anymore or you are. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm long, long gone. I do <laughs> even shooting the ball with my kids. Right. It's, it's a bit of a struggle. But no, yeah. I retired. So I played eight years. I retired when I was. 30 years old. That was 2014. So I'm uh -huh. about 39 years old now. So I've been, been out of the game for some Oh, time. you're over the hill. Forget it. That's crazy. I, I, you could argue I was over the hill when I was still playing. Right? <laughs> I think that was the problem, but I'm definitely over the hill now. That's amazing. Well, I want to transition a little. Um, you know, as a Stanford graduate, I'm sure you're aware of the rise of anti-Semitism on college campus, um, including some prestigious ones on the West Coast, like Berkeley and the like. So I just did a post literally last night. I listened to one of the most disturbing uh, speeches uh, at a commencement at CUNY, which is a locally New York taxpayer funded school. Their law school had, a, you know, one of their graduates was giving a commencement talk. Um, who I, I can't even tell you how upsetting it was to listen. Uh, she said, and I'm quoting because I wrote it down, she says that Israel continues to indiscriminately rain bullets and bombs on worshipers, murdering the old, the young, attacking even funerals and graveyards as it encourages lynch mobs to target Palestinian homes and businesses. This is New York City. And that comment that she made, she got people were clapping and I'm looking in the audience. It's faculty, it's administration, it's other students. This is going on all over the country. I'm wondering, you're a um, proud Jew, grandson, Holocaust survivors. Um, what, what do you have to say about this? Like, um, and and, and I'm, I'm wondering if you experienced this, I mean, uh, in Stanford or if this, I don't know if this is happening uh, in, in Stanford as well, to some degree. I know I went to Columbia for graduate school and I know in New York City, and I know it's a problem there. Um, I'm just interested in on your take on this because you know I, I um, you know, right wing white supremacy kind of anti semitism is easy to call out. It's pretty obvious, and there's no backlash when you critique it. But the kind of anti semitism that's now coming, or the Israel anti Israel rhetoric um, that's coming from the the hard left now. A um, little more complicated, and it doesn't get called out so much. I mean, I this this, this um, I haven't heard a lot, not from a lot of the Jewish organizations, and not from our elected officials. Um, the mayor of New York posted something, you know, that he didn't like the speech, but didn't say anything about um, the anti-Israel comments there. Um, just curious, what your feeling is about that. Yeah, I, I, it's happening all over the country. I don't, you know, you can't be Jewish anywhere in the world and not experience anti-Semitism. You know, I went to business school at Stanford as well. We had swastikas drawn on our campus when I was there in 2017, right? So this is, mm -hmm. there's, this takes different forms, as you said. And I, yeah, I think the, the anti-Israel rhetoric, it, it's so troubling and upsetting and it lacks so much context understanding you know i've i've lived in israel i've run to bomb shelters i've been afraid of you know there's 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 so much happening there and the narrative the way it's twisted and kind of how advocacy is in the in the name of advocacy instead it's kind of hate is what's yeah perpetuated yeah. by by talking about these things in this way right i think it it's terribly upsetting i think our job is to educate to help people understand all the amazing things that the state of Israel does. I'm mean, listen, no place is perfect, right? Everyone's trying to get things right. Everyone's trying to be better, but to, to frame the state of Israel in the way that you just said is, is absolutely terrible. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, I was just talking to my son about this, you know, when I was writing the post last night, you know, and he said to me that, you know, it's a complicated situation and it's okay for people to voice their opinion about what's happening. But, you know, to me, it's just when blatant lies, you know, murdering old and young people, attacking funerals and graveyards, Israel specifically, you know, pinpoints terrorists and goes to such great lengths to just 
take out the bad guys, you know, whereas our enemies over there are doing exactly the opposite. They're targeting civilians. And um, I don't know. I'm just I, 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 don't, I don't really have any, you know, I'm just I guess I'm venting right now, but I'm just upset. And I, I, I posted um, the email for the chancellor of CUNY. This is a, a city a city funded school. And this is the next generation of lawyers being produced by New York City, right? You know, and 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 being clapped by faculty and administration. It's just, it's 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 unbelievable. There's zero nuance. There's zero conversation. And all you have to do is just keep, like Hitler taught us, that you know, you keep repeating a lie. At some point, people are gonna gonna listen. I mean, does everyone? I'm just thinking to myself, like, does everyone actually believe that Israel does that? You know, when she made those remarks, the student, and the the answer is they don't know. But when other people are clapping around you, clap, and then it becomes a, a reality. All of a sudden, Israel's targeting children, Palestinian children. It's it's unbelievable. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. not everyone believes it, but I'm sure many do, right? And that's that that's the problem. And as we know, yeah, they're. And your son was right. There's so much nuance. It is so complicated. People can voice their opinions and their perspectives on things. That's how it should be. But to yeah, to blatantly misrepresent the facts and how things how things are is it's so troubling. And it's just the work we always have to do is to continue to educate, continue to stand up for ourselves because there's precedent for for this type of talk. This and yeah, that that's our job is just yeah, to continue. You know, to and and I, I and I'll tell you, I, I also Dan, I struggle because. I'm very against the whole cancel culture. I think people should be allowed to express their point of view. Um, and I think it's unhealthy for free speech and democracy to just cancel someone because you disagree with their perspective. But what happens if you if you keep having people just spewing outright lies, and nobody challenges them? You know, what else is the Jewish community supposed to do? Just allow that to happen. You know, we don't get, you know, there was no, I don't know. Somebody, somebody commented on my um, it was either my Instagram or Facebook that, you know, if I had been there, I would have run up on the stage with an Israeli flag. You know, yeah. uh, we can't, we don't even get a chance to have a conversation about it. It's just the damage is done. Right. So, how do you think the NBA handled the whole Kyrie situation um, when he came out with these, you know, blatantly anti-Semitic statements and? Do you think they handled it? You know, I'm asking you as somebody who has a real connection with with the NBA. Your dad played for them, and you yourself, professional basketball player. Do you think they handled that better? Do you think they could have done something different? They still could. And just, I'm curious, just in general, in the world of sports, you know, which, you know, as on some level should not get political. It should just be sports, but. I don't know. Do you think they should venture into these areas or they should be doing more? So the first thing I'll say about that is the Kyrie Irving situation for me personally was terribly upsetting, right? Because he he tweeted this link to this highly anti-Semitic book, movie, and that's dangerous. That's destructive, right? For those views to be shared with millions of people. And as we said, not all of them are going to believe it, but many will. Yeah. And so... The, for me, I, I lost sleep over that. You know, I talked to my grandma about it. Again, 98 next month, Holocaust <laughs> survivor. I said, what, un, I call her Unyu, which means mother in Hungarian. I said, Unyu, mm. what, do you, you, what do you think of this? You know, and she just shook her head. You know, she, she had her family killed for people saying things about Jews, thinking things about Jews, right? So anytime those things are spread, particularly at such a big scale, it's terribly upsetting for me, right? And this is our game. This is basketball. To your question... I have an extraordinary amount of respect for the NBA, how they handle things, how they're always on the front lines of social justice, doing what's right, standing up for people who aren't being treated fairly. So I I think a a true leader in this space, this is, this is a complicated situation. And they they acknowledge that they tried their best to discipline and to make good and give Kyrie opportunities, Kyrie Irving opportunities. So, Mm -hmm. I am actually less focused on how the league responded and how the team responded because I have such great confidence in what they've done to date with really important issues like this. What upset me about this situation is that 
there wasn't one current NBA player who proactively spoke up against this. Mm. And the players have also been been great speaking up and being a force for good in society. And that's it's wonderful. And you know, my grandparents always shared the message of we need to stand up for ourselves, but we also need to stand up for others. We need to we need to have allies and we need to be allies, right? Because when people aren't treated fairly, regardless of their religion, their skin color, their beliefs, whatever it is, if people aren't being treated fairly, it's not okay. And so you need to stand up for that, whether it's you or someone else. Because th- my grandma says to this day, there was a time where we really needed voices and there weren't yeah. enough of them. Yeah. And we saw what happened. And so for me, to not hear the the players speak out against this and kind of come, you know, stand on the side of of Jewish people around the world who who were scared, right? There were there were threats to preschools in New Jer- Jewish preschools in New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. My nephew goes to a Jewish preschool in New Jersey, right? So there are families who are who are scared because of, and that's not just because of Kyrie Irving or Kanye West or these no, people. Said no, no. It but, certainly doesn't help, right? It doesn't help to spread these right. messages. So that's where that's where kind of my frustration, maybe some anger, maybe some fear came from with that situation is that these really destructive views are being spread. And I just, the the silence for me was deafening. Yeah. It's a little like when I was listening to uh, at the, at the commencement, uh, you know, at the CUNY law school, just like everybody clapping, nobody, why do you think nobody else from the MBA, the other, forget the MBA as an institution. I think you're making an excellent point. Where were the other players? Um, Are they, do they agree or they just they don't want to get involved i mean i mean if if this was if these kind of comments were made um by a jewish person about a black person i would imagine you'd have tons of jewish celebrities other jewish athletes if there's not as many of us (laughs) um you know condemning it and saying that's not who we are that's not what we believe um that's a little distressing no it, it's certainly upsetting, and I don't want to speculate because it, it's hard to know. It's hard to know why people make the decisions they do, and why there weren't more voices at that point in time. But I just look at the data, right? You, you just, and again, it's it's yeah. injustice, it's injustice, it's intolerance. You just want to see allyship. You want to see people speaking against that, and I didn't see a lot of that, and that that's what was distressing. I, I don't know why. I mean, there's a, there's a, it seems like there's some sort of breakdown in the black Jewish relations. I, I, I love what Dumasani Washington is doing. He was a guest on this podcast. Uh, he's the founder of the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. And he was very critical of the NBA for the way they handle the whole situation. Um, and he's a, he's a great black leader. Um, I know it, it seems like we're we're missing something. We're we're, we're not. There just there's, there's a deafening silence, and um, I, I can't in a million years believe that if the same situation were reversed, and there was some you know prominent Jewish person who made a nasty comment about black people, that um, we would be all over it. We would be condemning it left and right. And um, it's just quiet. I, I, I really think it's, I, I don't know what the solution is. I just think it's important for us to be aware. And I, and I appreciate you, you sharing that. That uh, Forget the NBA, where are the other players? Um, yeah. It was, again, like that, that was part of the situation that I looked at. And there are a lot of, a lot of NBA, not all NBA players are black or white or, you know, there's, there's, right. there's no, no, variety, no, of course, right? so, of course. It didn't have to be just black players, anyone in the NBA. It was any, it was any players, right? And but, you know, such... but, but because, because it's made by someone of who is black, then, then I guess that's kind of what we're looking for a little, <laughs> you know, for me, I, I just want to see allyship wherever yeah. it comes to you, right? 100%. Instead, and, and, and just standing up when things are, hateful, dangerous, and the themes that were in that movie that Kyrie Irving tweeted, right? The Holocaust didn't happen and Jews are the devil and things that are so outrageous, right? That's not a hard thing to stand against. And so you just, you you just like to see advocacy and there's great precedent for the black community, the Jewish community working together, helping each other, right? You know, 
both communities know what it's like to be persecuted, to not have equal rights yeah. in, in situations. And so you just always want to see love being spread, bridges being built. And there's still, there are so many people in the black community who advocate for the Jewish community and vice versa, right? So there's, there is a lot yeah. of that no, there were people and, and there there were many people from the I don't mean to misrepresent there were many people from the black community who spoke out against um against his terrible terribly anti-semitic statements. I'm just focusing because of what you said about the players. Yeah. yeah. I I think whenever people are being treated fairly, we should all speak up against it, right? No matter what the person looks like or thinks or feels or who they love or what they love. That's our obligation. That's humanity's obligation. Again, there's precedent. We've seen what's happened over history. If we're talking about my family, it's the Holocaust. That right? We see what yeah. hatred can lead to. But there are other people who look different than me, who think different than me, whose families have been through terrible things too, right? So it, it can happen, and, and we all need to speak up against that. Do, do you think there are not enough Jews in the end, in like just connected? Like we're not connected to each other. I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to make some sort of rational sense for, um, I don't, I don't want to say that it's coming from anti-Semitism. I don't know. I'm, I'm asking sincerely, do you think there's just not enough inroads being made between, um, you know, athletes in the NBA and, 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 and Jews? Um, and again, I'm not I talking about the NBA as an institution. I'm talking about the players. Because that's who you mentioned, you know, that's who you said was was disturbing, that nobody said anything. Right. In, the, in that particular situation, we can extrapolate it, right? Because if you look at the data around education around the Holocaust and how much do millennials know about the Holocaust, it, it's really horrifying how little people know about it. So it's, it's just an issue in society. And I, I think it does always, for me, relate back to education and knowledge and share. And that's one thing I'm proud mm -hmm. of, of my book, right? Because my family has this interesting basketball story, but it's also a Holocaust story. So it's a little yeah. more accessible. So yeah. I've gotten a lot of feedback from people actually all over the world about, oh, my, my nephew read your book, actually, and now they know about the Holocaust, right? So it's how do we share stories and how do we share information and, and understand each other better, right? So I, I, again, I can't speculate about the presence of Jewish people in sports or in this community or that community. I just I, I'm just assuming I'm just assuming if there were more uh, points of connection between, um, you know, athletes, whether they're African-American, black or not. And Jews, they would be maybe more understanding. There's often a lot of ignorance and what that breeds, um, you know, nothing good comes out of ignorance as a result of just not being connected sufficiently. Yeah, uh, listen, the more the more we understand each other the better. And that it goes both ways, right? For us to understand different cultures, for different cultures to understand our culture, yeah. that, that's always there, that's always a powerful thing, is that understanding and that knowledge. Yeah. And and just one one last thing, um, just on this, because I'm curious. And and I know you're not a an authority on anti-Semitism. You're not I'm not interviewing the head of the ADL here, uh, but you are a very proud Jew whose grandparents survived whose father is the only member of the NBA, was the only member of the NBA who had, you know, Holocaust, uh, whose parents were survivors of the Holocaust. Like, if, 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 you know, MGE, I don't know how much you know about our organization. It's for 20s and 30s living in the sort of the tri-state area in New York City. I'm trying to, I'm always trying to help people not just get upset about situations, but to do something. So I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. So I wrote on my post last night that they should um, they should email Chancellor uh, Rodriguez, who is the Chancellor of CUNY now, and uh, they should tell him how upset they are. Is there any anything else that you think proactively we could be doing, uh, or we're we doing everything we can do, calling it out, sending an email to the Chancellor? Um, it just seems like. It's not making nearly enough of a difference. Um, you know, and, yeah. and more Holocaust education, I'm just wondering. Obviously, the more people know about the Holocaust, the better. But does that change it? Does that, does that dig in enough? We all can play a small part, 
right? We all can do what we can do. We, we all have an obligation to be on the side of, you know, again, building bridges, spreading love, educating people. So we can write letters. We can talk about our faith, our customs, our traditions, right? We can, you know, again, my, what I've done is I wrote a book about my family's history. I can, like we're doing now, speak about that, speak about the themes, hope that some people pick it up, read it, share it with people who might not know about the community. We're never doing enough, right? There's always more to do, particularly with such an important issue like this. So when I talk to groups and say, how can I engage? Like all the people who are likely listening to this and are part of your organization, that's already a huge step because you're you're part of the community. You're kind of, you know, you're spending time with each other, learning about different things. How do you spread that outward, talk to different people. Some people like to post on social media. Some people like to have a quiet meal with a friend. How, I, I never like to try to tell people how you should do it, mm -hmm. but you should do it, right? You should talk whatever about it. it. Is, whatever, whatever it is, whatever it is, right? Because we, we all have a small part we can play, but at scale, if everyone is committed to, you know, just talking about these themes, educating certain people, it can make a difference. It, yeah. it can, you know, listen, like, if we could all change the world just with a snap of the fingers, we would do it. It's not that easy, but that small part that we all can play, we, we have an obligation to do that. Yeah. I appreciate the encouragement, Dan, because um, I'm a little, as you can hear in my tone, I'm a little, um, I don't know, just a, I was very upset to listen to it. You know, I, I know it's out there. I've heard it before. I guess I just haven't heard it in New York City with people clapping and now what you're sharing about um, the other athletes not speaking out, it's, it's disturbing to me. Um, I'm a very, it, yeah, please. It, it is, it's, it's discouraging, it's distressing in certain situations. And I, I've shared this before, my grandma, about two, three months ago when some of these, you know, these very public anti-Semitic conversations were happening, you know, I, I wear a Star David necklace and my, that my grandmother got me. You know, so it's very special to us. And sure. she's told me not to wear that necklace in public, right? And so Whoa. that's so sad that my how grandma- long, How long ago was that? A few months ago. Oh, just and, a few months ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. the, yeah. And, and actually, she's repeated it a, a couple of weeks ago. She said it to me. And she I, was I nervous always, that she was nervous. You, you know, know, people, you know, violence and you don't want people to know. And listen, I, all, I usually always listen to my grandmother. I didn't listen on this one, right? But- Reflecting back on that conversation, my grandmother, both my grandparents survived the Holocaust, lost their family, fled communism, yeah. this whole story. And here my grandmother is in the United States of America telling her grandson, you know, not to don't, wear, the, yeah. don't wear that. That's sad. That's it, it, sad, it, it, right? it is sad. And I commend you. First of all, it's totally understandable. My dad, who didn't go through any of this, sometimes gets nervous when he sees me wearing my kippah in the street. Because he grew up at a different time, you know. We we're we're more similar in age, obviously, than, and and they um, they're not used to that, you know. And we we grew up in the United States, and we feel, I don't know, I feel, you know, I had the same conversation with my kids when there were all these attacks in New York City, and my kids didn't want to take their keep on. And I told them, whatever you want to do, you want to wear a baseball hat. You don't want to wear the kippah, but I just said you can't you can't have your headphones on anymore, and I want you to carry something, um, whether right. it was mace or something else, because there were unfortunately things happening, and um, and they said fine, but they didn't want to take the yarmulke off. So I I think you did the right thing, even though we're supposed to listen to our grandmothers, especially if they're Holocaust survivors. <laughs> but I, I almost I, always listen to her. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, but she's from a different world. Look what she look what she saw which he survived. Right. I can't, I can't believe we, we, we have to go back to that place where we have to take our yarmulkes and our mug and Davids off. Yeah. That, and that, those are some of the considerations, you know, you know yeah. my grandma for your dad, but we keep being proud yeah. of who we are standing up for ourselves, we are. standing up for others. Dan, keep it on. I'm not taking my yarmulke off and um, we, we need to push back. Like, you know, Thank you so, so much for sharing your amazing, amazing story. Um, the name of Dan's book is called The Grace of the Game, uh, From the Grips of the Nazis to the Top of the Olympics uh, Podium. And I did not know that your father got a gold medal. That's unbelievable. I love this. From the cheap seats to center stage at Madison Square Garden, from yellow stars to silver spoons, 
This complex tale traverses the spectrum of the human experience to detail how perseverance, love, and legacy can survive throughout generations carried on the shoulders of a simple and beautiful game, basketball. Um, Basketball, it is, right? Sports. I just remember, by the way, I'm also from Queens. And um, the most of the interactions that I had with non-Jews, blacks, Latinos, Jew, whatever, Italians, was playing. I played a lot of basketball when I was younger. Was playing basketball in the park with whoever you know, pickup games. I, that's what I did every Sunday for years. And um, I really, really hope that sports, the NBA, can continue to be a place uh, where you know the great equalizer, as you said, where we could all. We can come together. Yeah, it, it is, right? We always said in our family, the ball doesn't care what language you speak, doesn't care what religion you yeah. are, doesn't care what color your skin is, what country yeah. you're from. It just brings people together. And it does that. And I, I believe in the goodness of people, the goodness of the game. And, you know, again, we just, we do our small part. We spread positivity and, and hopefully that grows. Amen. Thank you Amen. for being so positive and encouraging. I appreciate it. Thank you, you for it. coming on, Dan. It's an amazing story. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much.